Okay, we need to get the clock uh, back to zero. Uh, Pedro, can we test your microphone? Can you speak? Hello, hello. Perfect, very good. Okay, cool. uh, Monica, test your microphone. I think I'm fine, no? Perfect. Mine is not working. Okay, yeah, yeah, Ivan. Okay, yeah. great. So we just need to get the timer set and then we're ready to go. Until that thing says 30, uh, I still stay here. Okay, absolutely brilliant. Uh, okay, the next panel is on IoT and driving cross-country value. Uh, take it away, Pedro. Round of applause, please, for Pedro. Yay! Come on, all of you, give a round of applause. Okay, guys, um, so we're going to do this panel in English. Um, we have here two amazing experts, uh, Monica, who's the founder and chairman of uh, net for things and Ivan, who is running Internet of Things for EY all over Europe. And I'm going to be I'm making a short intro. I, I just turned 41. And I think I'm uh, the last year of the Generation X. I think my generation was responsible for bringing social networks, smartphones in the market. And as a result, I think that most uh, executives in, the, um, in Generation X are, are building open organizations. We're connecting people, and we're making organizations flexible, liquid, and open. So you see that. Um, Generation X uh, entrepreneurs are usually founders of big platforms like social media companies or Airbnbs or Ubers or things like that. The next generation, Generation Y, and I see lots of, of, of them here, millennials, you are going to be facing a world where everything is connected. And if you see the trouble we've gotten into by connecting people, you guys are going to be facing a lot more trouble because now your chair, your clothes, everything is going to be connected. But at the same time, we're going to have many more ideas and many more business opportunities for everybody. Yeah, I think it's going to be huge. So I think Generation X connected people, Generation Y connected things, and then Generation Z or the, the centennials, the guys who are in high school right now, are really going to be the, you know, facing the toughest period, which is basically uh, building an artificially, artificial intelligence powered world, which is, I think, the challenge of challenges. So I have two amazing people here with me. And um, of course, I, you know, they have really cool projects going on. So I, if you want to take a minute or two to explain what you do. And Monica, if you want to start. OK. So I started this company seven years ago as a spin-off of a security company where we were producing alarms. And we were interested in, in controlling what was going on in the house, not just for security reasons, but but as a, as a, as a user, you, you want to have everything under control, not only the safety, but all your belongings and all your beloved. That means children, pets, uh, families, whatever, and the car. So that's how we started on trying to produce a low-cost uh, digital home, smart home. And eventually, because the market wasn't really ready and digital homes ha are still to come, we pivoted to the connected car, which is what we're now doing, and we expect to have over 2 million uh, connected cars this year. So what we do is in the aftermarket, new cars are already embedded systems, so they have the plugged-in uh, situation where you have a connected car, well, that means Wi-Fi and in a smart car that informs you of what's going on. But just in Spain, there's over 18 million cars that are not connected and are very easily connectable for a very reasonable price. You just connect your car, you have Wi-Fi, you have all the services you may think of. I'm not going to go on the list, they can be long. And, uh, and we hope it's really going to be a massive implementation. It's already running in America and we are launching in, in Bahrain, in the north of Spain already is running. And we have clients now in two dif three different continents. So you're that's what you're only doing. doing this B2B or also It's B2B. B2B. So you'll never see a Net for Things connected car. You always see it through a, another a big telco or insurance company. Those are mostly the companies which we're working with. Thank you. Okay. Ivan, you work all over Europe with uh, Internet of Things projects and uh, you probably many clients. So tell us about what you do and something that you're really excited about that you've done recently. Thank you very much, guys, for, for being here. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yes, as, I, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, I, I am part of the uh, IoT, IoT advisory team for EY. Uh, we work, which is funny, because when you think about EY, you basically you think accounting, right, or audit. But uh, in fact, we have a very, very strong capabilities from the point of view of uh, tech, tech advisory. Uh, as it was mentioned earlier, we work all over the world. 
in all different sectors, uh, oil and gas, smart cities, power and utilities, consumer, logistics, everything. Um, and yes, I mean, we're, we're very excited about what's going on right now, connecting all these different emerging technologies, IoT, artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotics, the potential is huge. And, Tell and us something, if, if you can. Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Okay, so if you can, tell us about a project that you've been working on recently, without saying the name of the client if you want, yeah. but uh, where the client has been very smart about how, you know, how to leverage the IoT opportunity. Um, a very cool example that, that I can share is, for example, in the, in the oil and gas industry. I mean, I'm not an expert on this area, but uh, for example, when you produce diesel, uh, the process takes a lot of time, it, it requires a lot of uh, different processes and heat and pressure and different things, and at the end of the process, at the end of 90 minutes of production of diesel, they, they always take a sample, they send it to the lab, and they test the quality. Now, if the quality is good, whew, well done, we can keep going, right? If the quality is not good, if the quality is not satisfactory, we have a problem, we need to start again. Now, imagine this happening 24-7 all over the world in all these different uh, uh, refineries. Uh, so the client came to us with a question, like, can you, do you have any sensors that could measure quality using IoT? And we thought about it, and there is no such thing as a quality uh, measure sensor. But we came up with the idea of, okay, what if we use all the sensors that are gathering data, we look at all the historical data of uh, all the entire process, and combining with artificial intelligence, we create a model that can give us the, the prediction of what's going to be the level of quality of the product in the following batch. So we, we created a proof of concept and uh, uh, we, we got a rate of 93% of, of probability that the following batch was going to have a, a satisfactory level of quality. Now the really interesting thing is that when you're talking about this type of solutions, this is applicable in every single process in the industrial uh, process. We we're talking about chemicals, uh, cement, uh, beer, food, tobacco, electricity, so this solution that came out of you know, diesel production, we are currently implementing it all over the world, uh, combining IoT and AI. So, so this is one of the very interesting solutions that we're currently uh, developing globally. Yesterday we were having a conference and we were speaking to a few guys who were doing a very smart model like that in the, for something called preventive maintenance. Yeah. And it's basically if I have sensors in your car, in your tires, in your paint everywhere, I can understand how when something's not going right and I can fix it before it breaks down. Yeah. So actually I make you happy because you're not wasting your time and you don't have a damaged car and at the same time I'm making more money because I'm giving you a better service. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing is then they were putting sensors on tires, for example in coal mines for the, for the carts that were moving the coal and when they notice a certain vibration, it means that part of the tire is broken and they need to change it before it actually you know, creates, it, creates an accident. And they realize that a tire is a tire. So uh, using that same model for a coal mine or an airplane or a, a car is very similar. So yeah. as you said, cross-industry utilization of these uh, models is becoming very interesting. And that's when it gets really exciting, that you are not, you are not, I mean, something that I always recommend to everybody when we're talking about emerging technologies is avoid thinking in silos. Because very often there is this tendency to think, okay, this is AI, and this is analytics, and this is IoT, and this is robotics. The, the companies that are going to really, really take full advantage of the potential of these technologies are the ones that are looking across the whole spectrum. Yeah. That they're starting to understand that bringing IoT and, and, I, and AI and blockchain and you know, putting some functions with robotics, that's what creates the real value. And that's what is going to make the difference in the long term. Well, it's really the, the different phases of a diamond. You can't have a diamond with just one phase. AI wouldn't exist without IoT. Where is AI getting all the information in order to be able to predict and reduce or increase efficiencies, as you're saying? But that's, that's what we see as consumers, as, uh, as people. What's behind, what are the economics behind it? Is all these amount of information that is so efficiently treated or crunched then it can produce, as you were saying, I can foresee when it's going to break. So then the economics of what's behind it, like in our connected car, if you've run already 36,000 kilometers, which is the average kilometers you need to spend your, to, to, to really go on renewing your tires. 
who has the economics behind the, the, maintenance, um, uh, the maintenance garage where they sell the the, 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 the wheels? So as they are connected to the system and the platform is giving information to all those on your area, what are you receiving? You're receiving an input as to a pop-up in, in your APP saying, you're about to be uh, out of uh, margins with the, with the wheels. You get three for two, three for the price of two on your nearest garage. So that are the economics. So who's going to pay for all this information that is bringing into you a capacity to decide and to avoid accidents? The economics behind, which is all the market behind the scenes, which are being nourished by the data crunch from the IoT. Are you planning to make any money out of uh, oh, oh yes, of that, course. Of I'm, data? A, I'm a business. <laughs> this is a company. This is how, not how are you going to make money out of data, not just well, selling in fact, devices? Well, like, for instance, with a telco company, you know, that w one of our clients. The telco company is going to provide it as a bundle in, in other services they produce. A telco company, like in Spain, they, they've already reached their ceiling of clients. Everybody has a phone, a mobile phone, so there's no possibility to increase your market. So how do you increase your, the number of SIMs of the little intelligent card without having new, 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 new clients? Well, cars are the next client because connecting a car means putting a SIM into each one of the cars. There is 18 old cars in Spain, so that's 18 new potential clients. So Telefonica, for instance, or Orange, or Vodafone, or any of the big telcos, are always trying to find new solutions to, uh, to increase the loyalty of their clients. So this is going to be one of their things. Like, they started with TV. Everybody has a, a pay TV at home, which is bundled with any of the big telcos. The next thing they're going to provide is the car. So we are going to charge, not directly because we are B2B, but the telco charges the user for this new service and then they pay to us. So that's a, that's a business model. Okay. So who's, who's under 25 here? Raise your hand. A lot of you, right? So I'm going to give you a few ideas on how to build a profitable business model with data. Think about the old guys, how they sold cars. We, the business was selling a car or repairing a car, right? And then you own it, I have no relationship with you. Then middle-aged guys, they would lease a car or rent a car, right? And the reason we were able to do this is because companies knew more or less how drivers would behave, so they knew more or less what risk they were taking. So they would say, I, I will keep the ownership of the car and I will lease it to you, but uh, I'm gonna charge you more, so I'm gonna get more margin, because I know how you're going to behave. Like if you're a crazy driver that drive, um, while you're partying on a Friday night, you're not interesting for me. But if you're a, a father of two and you are very, uh, you know, you have all your points in your, in your um, driver's license, you're the perfect driver for me. Now, think about a new model. Companies are saying, okay, if I give you the car as a service and you let me access the data of your car in real time, so I know where you are, your speed, when you change your oil, the temperature of your engine, how, many, how much water you have in your engine and everything, uh, I'm gonna have a much better monitoring capacity of your vehicle. And if it's about to break, don't worry because in the middle of your trip from Madrid to Barcelona, I will send you a, a notification saying, please pull over in the next gas station and there will be somebody waiting for you to refill your oil, right? So you can keep going. Okay, of course, this is gonna be much more expensive, but it's good money for you. So, Many companies are starting to do this. General Electric is doing this when they sell airplane, turbine, airplane turbines, when they're say, selling wind turbines. And uh, think about anything that was usually sold once through, and now you can rent as a service, and you can keep an open uh, platform for sharing data, okay? And then on the other side, there's gonna be a business about protecting that data, because an open flow of data is a, is a point of vulnerability for many companies and many clients. So people are going to be more concerned about privacy and uh, cybersecurity. So you know, the, in these two areas, you have amazing businesses that are going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. So think about it. Any business that runs today on that old model, you can change it into the new one.
Yeah. I think what a IoT adds to AI, because what you were commenting, the, ca the, the, the case you were presenting is AI is capable of predicting due to past, um, um, past actions. IoT in this case, in the car, for instance, is not AI. It's really real-time information because the car is producing the information. You're not really going on statistics of the past, but on the reality of your own car because you have an intelligent car. So IoT in this case enriches the possibility and the, and the kind of uses you may use. And the one thing you were talking about, cybersecurity and privacy, that's the downside. We were talking about China just before, no? What comes with the IoT is that all these, uh, and this we're coming now to the macro projects of big cities with all these sensors all around and cameras and uh, whatever. And uh, we have the case of Xinjiang, where it's an Orwellian city. Everybody knows who you are, what you're doing, your face, ADN, uh, behavior, uh, past records, religion, they have a problem with, uh, with the Muslim people now, they're putting them into uh, to, um, re-educational centers because just because they are Muslim and they have behaved in a certain way. So the big problem about IoT in the, in the big cities is that privacy is continuously uh, invaded. In the Western world, we have more regulation, which is uh, we are used to um, nobody can, uh, the police cannot come into your home unless it has a warrant by the, by the uh, warrant, so you, you are protected. But in places like China where regulation of privacy is not protected, it's really a, a big issue as to how people are going to eventually come against IoT because it reduces their intimacy and their privacy and they're really in the hands of whoever is in power, and not always those in power are very respectable. So that is one issue which has to be overcome by regulation, and this is so new, we're still starting to regulate accordingly to the realities, so. And I, I was mentioning backstage that I was in China two weeks ago, and China, you know, they are very committed to whatever they decide, and they, 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 they go for it very strongly. A few years ago, it was cheap labor, and now it's artificial intelligence. And they have a country-wide commitment with artificial intelligence. And they don't care about pri privacy very much. So, and this is real, like going from my hotel to the conference center every morning, I would get spotted by three, 400 cameras. And, and they have uh, created a, what they call a social credit score. I don't know if you follow Black Mirror. That is exactly the chapter of Black Mirror where if you behave badly, you get in a fight, you get drunk, you cross the road on the wrong time, you get, you get bad credit. And that means that you cannot take your kid to, to private school, you cannot get on an airplane, you cannot get credit to buy a house. Things like that are happening right now. So my question is, Ivan, you, you travel all around Europe and you see that now we're creating all these regulations for data protection, for privacy, but these guys and these don't care. So they, they're just building massive amounts of data and they're perfectioning their algorithms much faster than we are. Have we lost the race on artificial intelligence? Uh, I think that, we, I mean, the, the, the case of China is the extreme. <laughs> like, it's hard to, 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 should we worry that this is happening right now today? We should be concerned. Is this going to happen to us soon? Hopefully not. <laughs> But I don't think that, uh, that this is something that we need to be concerned at this moment in time. Uh, especially that what, when I, what I see the most, when we're talking about, I mean, we're talking about governments, we're talking about organizations, we're talking about companies. Uh, I think that companies want to have access to data because they want to sell you more products. They want to sell you more services and they want to make more money. That's it. Governments, they might have different agendas. Uh, we, we, for example, we have done the IoT strategy for uh, one of the smartest cities in the world, in the Middle East, I cannot say which one, uh, but uh, the, the goal, for example, for, the, for that city, they want to be the, the, the most advanced and they want this, the citizens to be the happiest. Something that they did is they created a, a, a happy happiness uh, index. For index. And basically they look at all the different elements that are important for their citizens. And every single decision they are making from the point of view of investment on new technology, regulation, uh, policies, is regarding of how are they going to be able to address those specific uh, happiness elements for their citizens. 
uh, that involves a lot of IoT, that involves a lot of AI, and that involves a lot of different technologies. So we see, I mean, again, we see the whole spectrum. We see companies that are, they see technology as, um, you know, investing in technology so the technology can support their workers and their employees. On the other hand, you have companies that are investing a lot of money, so the operations are fully auto, out, out, automatized, right? So there is no people. There is factories working 24-7 with three people just, you know, swapping. <laughs> and, and, and we have the whole spectrum, right? So which one is the right approach? I think, I think it depends on what are the values of the company, depends on so what are the strategic objectives, uh, and, and what is the long-term vision of the, of the organization and of the government. Uh, from the point of view of China, they are going in that direction, but there are many different uh, governments and organizations going in a different approach. There are little things, little quotidian things, like for instance now, uh, and this was invented by a Spaniard, and one wonders how nobody invented it before. Now when you go into a, park, a parking place, and you, you have the green lights or the red lights on the, on the roof, and that gives you exactly where's the nearest uh, park sp uh, spot. And then you think, well, now before I had to go round and round until I found a place to put my car in. And just as you enter now, you look up on the roof and you know exactly. That is efficiency. It's that convenient. is saving you time, time that you can dedicate for idleness or for happiness or whatever. That is IoT. That's not AI because AI would be this now, the second stage of these green lights, it gives information to a, a smart city grid where you get all this information so when the people enter the city or you have an app, you get the information already as to where is the nearest parking place, parking garage, where you, can, where you have a guarantee of finding the right place. So this is efficiency. This makes life so much easier to everyone. So I think that even we have the issues of privacy, we have this huge uh, uh, issues that are going to improve our lives in, in how we do everything. There's one other problem, one other downside is the, the, the crunching of data and the obtention of data is favoring corporate concentration, monopolies. And that is one of the big issues now in the, in the world uh, headlines as to because all this information is not that easy to crunch or to transform into in smart information. Who are getting, who are managing, and who are leveraging on this information that they're getting? And it's not the little or medium companies. It's not SMEs who are really, SMEs are producing uh, software to analyze. But the result of the information is increasing power to those who are already very powerful. So one of the big issues is we really have to be very attentive to how regulators are going to face this new phase in terms of how are we going to control this amount of concentrating power in corporations. Do you think it's possible to, con uh, to control it? Or we should just uh, buy stock to have a pension fund? Huh. No, I wonder if I had the, 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 the answer as to how to control it, I would be a regulator, I'm not. I, on the contrary, I'm always trying to find ways to go around the regulator. But, <laughs> but I suppose there, there are going to be big issues and this is coming already. We have this huge story in, in Europe, in the European um, uh, Council as to what are they doing with Google, they are uh, controlling. I don't know, there will probably be somehow ways to control how they manage the information. But it, it, it is a very, very important issue. It's really very relevant. Uh, one, one, one thing I wanted to say, I mean, you can look at both things. You can see the, 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 the challenges or the dangers, or you can look at the opportunities. Yeah. I think that uh, something that I really put a lot of attention is I work a lot in, in building awareness of the huge potential that these technologies can bring to, to organizations. Uh, when, when we identify and they realize, okay, what are the business objectives? So they want to focus on, on let's say, optimization of their processes how to increase productivity, how to cut costs. IoT can be a great solution for that. Absolutely. Yeah. On the other hand, IoT can help organizations grow. So how can, how can this technology can help you develop new business services, uh, new IoT-enabled services, new products, uh, new user experiences? So I, I always like to, to people to, to, to Think about IoT not just as you know a silver bullet that is going to solve things or it's going to cause a lot of troubles, 
but it's, it's, a, it's a tool that we have in our toolbox that thanks to that is going to help us solve different problems. Now, once we identify what is the business objective, we can go, okay, we want to we wanna focus on optimization, fine. We focus on asset management, we focus on process management, we can help you cut costs. Or do we want to focus on growth? Okay, we can do that. We can create new business models, create new services, create new uh, value. I, I strongly believe that at the end of the day, everything comes down to value. What's the value that these technologies bring to the organization? What's the value that they bring to the consumers? What's the value that they bring to the citizens? Yeah. And, and, and that's what should guide the, the, the direction a, when it comes to That's an excellent up. point because you know, people say that data is the oil of the 21st century and whoever owns the data will own the market. Uh, and uh, owning the data is not the same as owning the infrastructure where the tra data travels through. You can be the owner of the bank or you can be the owner of the telco, but you have no ownership of the data. So I wonder, and but I just want to say, that the funny thing is that there is this misunderstanding about data. Like, we, we have clients coming to us saying, like, data monetization, yes. We have a lot of data, how can we sell it? And I'm like, mm, no, it, that's, not, that's not data monetization. You don't, you don't monetize your data by selling it. You monetize your data by creating new value. So what is the value that this data is going to bring to you, to your partners, to your customers, to your suppliers? That's the reasoning that you should be having. So yes, you have all the data, great. What are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna create an ecosystem that allows people to, 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 to benefit from that data? Are you gonna build new services where you can be sharing this data so everybody benefits? Or are you gonna try to sell it? Because yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's unfortunately the reasoning very often. I think uh, one of the most interesting people I've met in the last six months has been the CEO of Alibaba in Europe. And uh, he said, you know, the, the small uh, corn, you know, business in the, you know, the small supermarket or the small convenience store in your neighborhood has nothing to be scared about uh, by the arrival of Alibaba. But the big surfaces, the big malls, the big supermarkets, uh, they should be very scared. And we are going to become the operating system for these uh, small, you know, family owned uh, businesses uh, that you have on the street. Uh, but then when we do that, we're going to provide a lot of value through data to those guys because we're going to tell them what they need to sell, how to lower their stock, how to advertise, how to rotate the products much faster, how to understand their customer faster, better because we have information about their position, their financial transactions, their demographic profile, what they own, what they buy. Uh, so we can be very accurate at uh, helping other people do better business. We can be very accurate, but unfortunately what I see is most organizations are not ready to take the chances and to experiment and to try these new things. I mean, from the technological point of view, we have the capabilities to do yeah. amazing stuff. The problem is when you get to the decision makers and the decision makers go, ah, very innovative. Has it been done before? No. Okay, so we wait and we don't do it. Yeah, but and that's always the story about innovation. Who are the early adopters? And that's one in a million, and the rest are followers. So you always have to push into finding the early adopter within an organization so that he will push it. In, my, in our case, we've been uh, talking about IoT for the past seven years, and just everybody was opening their eyes. So what are you talking about? And uh, the last, the very first uh, important uh, contract we signed took us two and a half years to persuade the people within the corporation, and they were all super nerds. Theoretically, they were the IT department, very advanced, all from MIT, you know, the top, top guys, and still, they were not entrepreneurs. So in a, they understand, but then making a decision to go to the market and spending an originally, an initial investment means that it's going to take a long time then to have a return. So big corporations have been very slow into adapting and digitalizing. So I think now it's finally we're here. Uh, people are seeing that the early adopters are taking advantage and if they don't get on the train, they're just going to stay behind forever and die. Because if you're not putting into all these devices into your company for robotization, for increased uh, efficiency, you won't be able to bring down your prices and, and, and compete with those who have already um, and, and the, entered the market. And the beauty of IoT is that you don't, have to, you don't have to make a huge investment. You can start small. 
Yeah. You can start small with a small use case, with a small project, yeah. a small problem that you want to solve, and how you use the technology to solve yeah. that specific problem. Then you move on to the next problem and the uh, next problem. It's not like you know, 10 years ago when you have to make a, a three years implementation of the new uh, SAP platform, right? And after three years, it's completely uh, obsolete. obsolete, right? This, you can start small, but very often, as I mentioned, yeah. is A, willing to take risks, willing to, under, to, to, to experiment and to try new things, two, understanding the potential that these technologies can bring to your organization and to your customers, and three, uh, focusing on adding value. If you focus on adding value, you're going to be, you, you're going to create uh, opportunities for success. If yeah. you are just focusing on putting sensors and technology and apps and, you know, AI and all the buzzwords, you're going to fail. So guys, we are running out of time, but I would say that if you were in 2004 and you were in an innovation conference and there was 30 minutes dedicated to social networks, it was the right time to build a company on, on social networks. We are on a three-day conference about innovation and entrepreneurship, and there's 30 minutes for IoT. This is the right time to build a company in IoT, and you're the right generation, so please go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, guys.